Welcome to Vision Analyst Insider Series Webinar and Brand Strategy. My name is Christy Allen. I'm the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the Moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there are some relevant white papers and case studies available for everyone to download. Also, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat box. We'll attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are Jerry Thomas. He's the President and CEO of Decision Analyst. Jerry has served as a research and analytic consultant to many major companies over the years. And Christy Sarmiento is co-presenting. She's a Vice President and Decision Analyst. She's skilled in all phases of both qualitative and quantitative research. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jerry. Thank you, Christy, and welcome to today's webinar on mar marketing and brand strategy. Um, we will be doing this uh, tag team and going back and forth as we go through the presentation. Brand strategy is a really interesting subject, and it's quite complicated, and especially in today's modern world where digital marketing has become much more important. Sometimes brand strategy gets lost in the shuffle or the strategy is not clear. So I think it's a really appropriate subject for, for this point in time. And we're, we're gonna talk about a little bit about the background of brand strategy, go through some examples, and then talk about the process of getting to a, a strategy. So first, what, what is a brand? Typically, we think of a brand as a name or a symbol or a sign that identifies and distinguishes one product or one service from all of the others. And we can think of that as kind of the, the most obvious or tangible uh, functions of, of a brand. But a brand can be much more than that. Um, a brand can also evoke or communicate other kinds of associations, memories, experiences, smells, symbols, values, images. Brands can have symbolic value as well as practical value. And we can kind of think of these, these latter properties of a brand as intangible aspects of a brand. Um, Trademark law, and there's a whole body of law about trademarks, uh, have, have a really interesting concept called secondary meaning. And as an example of this, uh, the word caterpillar is uh, the larva of a butterfly. But the word caterpillar also has acquired secondary meaning as a a company that manufactures uh, heavy earth moving equipment with associations and linkages of power and hardness and steel and scale and diesel clatter and the color yellow and construction and progress. And so the word caterpillar for the caterpillar company has acquired secondary meaning over usage. And so this secondary meaning is in, in effect has become the brand. So it's a really interesting concept. Now, we often hear the term brand equity, but what does brand equity really mean? So Jerry introduced this idea of secondary meaning, and that's essentially what brand equity is. It's the summation of this secondary meaning that attaches to a brand and accumulates over time. Brand equity is created by basically all of the brand touch points. It's uh, marketing or advertising, um, it's through your own experience with the product or service, and it's with the brand's reputation. To measure brand equity, we would first look at the brand's awareness level to see really what percentage of the target market is aware of the brand and what's the depth of that awareness. 
The next measure of brand equity is knowledge. So how much does the target market actually know about the brand? Then lastly, what comes to mind when we think about a brand's imagery? What images or associations and emotions are evoked by the brand? These are also strong indi indicators of brand equity, and we're actually going to touch on this a little bit later in the presentation. So brand origins uh, are most likely uh, lost to uh, the current generation. Um, but if you think about the evolution of branding, it really goes back to the end of the last ice age, 10 to 15,000 years ago, because we began a process of transitioning from a nomadic existence to more permanent settlements and then later on to, to cities. If you think about nomadic tribesmen, we tended to go to the resources. We didn't, you know, we engaged in limited trade, but trade wasn't very important because we were moving the whole tribe to where the resources were. But as we began to transition to more permanent settlements, then trade became much more important because we had to bring the goods to us. And so trade began to expand as settlements developed. And it's very likely that tens of thousands, you know, 10,000 years ago that artisans and producers or manufacturers of boxes, barrels, jars, uh, you know, and other types of products put some type of identifying marks on those products so that people would know in the future that this was a, a quality product and that it could be trusted. But of course, all of that's really lost to us. We, we, you know, it's been evolving. So brands are not new. They've been around for a very, very long time. There's no doubt. The word brand itself actually comes to us from the old Norse language, from the word brander, brand with an R on the end of it. And it means to burn. So with the development, with the domestication of animals, cows and horses and pigs and other things, uh, some type of hot iron branding was one of the ways that you could uh, claim ownership and mark ownership uh, of those animals. So uh, so that was part partly where the term came from. That dates back thousands of years. So we as human beings are actually flawed. And the reason that we're no, flawed... No, you're not really serious about that, are you? <laughs> oh, man. The reason that we're flawed is because we lack objectivity. We like certain things. We dislike other things. And essentially, we view the world through lenses that are tinted with our own hopes, dreams, biases, and prejudices. This is essentially why we have different uh, like political parties, um, different religions, different hobbies, etc. Marketing is all about taking advantage of our human flaw, this lack of objectivity. The ultimate goal of a brand is to create a bias or a prejudice. And that bias or prejudice is actually in favor of your brand so that consumers will choose your brand over a competitor. Now, normally when we hear the term prejudice or the term bias, we tend to think of something that's negative or possibly unfair, but that's actually a sign of successful branding. It's when your brand has an unfair advantage over all other brands. And in fact, that's really what marketing and branding are all about. It's about tilting the playing field in your brand's favor. So I think it will be helpful, uh, Christy, to run through some quick examples of branding and brand strategies. And we're going to show you some print ads uh, and then talk about the strategy that might relate to or underlie those brands. Um, these uh, examples that we're going to go through are not based on research that we've done, so we're not sharing any 
proprietary confidential information with you, but it's based on our opinions, hopefully informed by many years of research on brand strategy and years of testing ads. Mayhem has been a highly noticed and very entertaining. I love to watch these commercials for Allstate. But one struggles to understand what, what the strategy is that underlies the Mayhem campaign. Is the strategy to increase the sales of all insurance and by you know, and by that increase all state sales also, kind of a, a rising tide lifts all boats strategy. If, if that's the strategy, then maybe the campaign is doing well and is on strategy. But one wonders if this highly, it's very creative, extremely well done, but is it really building preference for Allstate over other insurance companies, or is it really promoting the whole industry? That's the question. The other question that one might reasonably ask is, what's the linkage between Mayhem and Allstate? Um, why am I going to remember this as an Allstate commercial rather than some other company. So we, we, we are suspicious that perhaps the linkage between the Allstate brand and Mayhem is weak. So this may not be a, an example of good <coughs> brand strategy. Now let's take a look at Avis. This We Try Harder campaign demonstrates a very successful yet unique brand strategy. When this campaign was developed in the 1960s, Avis was the number two car rental company in the industry. Hertz was actually the clear leader in the market. The brand's agency decided to tout the company's second place position in the market as kind of the reason why they couldn't afford to have things like long lines or dirty cars or an unfriendly staff, um, etc. This also somewhat cleverly implied that those things might be common at other car rental companies. In this campaign, you know, Avis wasn't promising better service or, or better operations. It was only promising to try harder. This was a solid strategy, which in our opinion was brilliantly executed. The claim is aspirational in that it doesn't make promises it can't keep. It only promises to try harder. Hallmark provides another example of a solid brand strategy, which can be described as premium products at a premium price. Now, there's really nothing fancy about the strategy, but the execution is very elegant. What's interesting is that, you know, greeting cards offer a means of expressing emotions, but they also offer a means of evoking emotions. The goal is not only to make the card's recipient feel good, but also to reflect a positive image on the sender, which is something I really never thought about. The tagline, when you care enough to send the very best, really taps into these powerful human emotions and communicates this premium strategy. So this is another example of a great brand strategy and a great execution. The fact that they've stuck with this campaign for so many years really magnifies the power and influence that it's had. Many years ago, uh, Marlboro was a minor brand of cigarettes with, uh, with a tilt to its fem toward, uh, feminine base. So the brand developed a strategy to target men. And at that time, there were many, many more men smokers than women smokers. Um, and so um, 
just a second, we've got to stop some construction out in the hallway. Okay, I think we've got the, we've got the construction stopped, sorry. Uh, so Marlboro was a relatively small brand of cigarettes consumed mostly by women. And, and the, the male market was a much, much larger market of smokers. So the decision was made to target men. And the decision to create Marlboro country based on Western imagery and the Marlboro man, the rugged cowboy, all set in an outdoor setting was brilliant. And it created an idealized image of masculinity that most men could identify with or want to identify with. And it was one of the most successful campaigns in, in the history of American marketing. So a, a great campaign, great strategy, and great execution. Morton Salt took an interesting approach with the campaign that was, we believe, probably um, driven by a consumer insight. So as you may know, salt has this annoying habit of clumping up when it's exposed to moisture. In 1911, Morton Salt began mag um, adding magnesium carbonate, which basically kept the salt from sticking together, creating the first free-flowing salt. They followed up this revolutionary solution with the introduction of this campaign in 1914 with the slogan, when it rains, it pours, which basically communicates that when it's rainy or humid, the salt still flows easily and freely. The basic strategy was pretty simple. It's basically to feature the new patented solution that addresses a consumer problem and links to a product benefit. The umbrella and the little girl, however, really struck a chord with American consumers and added a great execution to what was otherwise a simple yet solid strategy. The picture kind of tells the whole story, which is important because in 1914, radio and, t and TV didn't yet exist. Newspapers and magazines were the primary advertising media for this campaign. I think, you know, Christy, it's really interesting if you look at this uh, picture the little girl is very, you, can, you have the sense that she's walked down to the grocery store, perhaps, and is walking home. But look how uh, happy she is. Look how self-confident she is. Um, and somehow that really struck a chord with the American public. Um, so again, to your point that how you execute a strategy is often just as important as the underlying strategy itself. Um, when Toyota tried to come up, you know, to, to develop a premium priced uh, product and, uh, but was unable to do it under the Toyota brand name. The brand name simply would not stretch that far. So Toyota created the Lexus brand. And when the brand was introduced, they did it with a tagline reading, Lexus, the relentless pursuit of perfection. And this may be one of the best taglines ever created in American advertising, or Japanese advertising for that matter. And the, the key word, the, the activation word in that tagline was the word relentless, because it meant that Lexus was never going to stop, never give up, would go to the ends of the earth in, in pursuit of perfection. And certainly, you have the impression that perfection means the product itself is perfection, but it also, that word perfection can be applied to how the dealer treats you and the kind of service you get. And it, it's a very, it, it, it's a broad word and meaning. 
So this is an extremely powerful positioning theme line or tagline. And of course, uh, you know, when you have too good a tagline, the marketing and the advertising people grow tired of it and drop it. Um, but if Lexus is still not using this, they ought to be. This ought to be the tagline that they use forever with Lexus. A great, great tagline and a brilliant strategy. So Southwest Airlines Freedom Campaign was a reflection of a successful alignment between brand strategy and business strategy. Uh, you know, Southwest has always strived to own the low cost market and they've made very strategic business decisions along the way that have allowed them to, you know, really keep their prices low. So for instance, Southwest only flies Boeing 737s, and this creates tremendous maintenance efficiencies across the board. They also tend to fly in and out of smaller airports, such as Dallas's Love Field instead of DFW, or Chicago's Midway instead of O'Hare. And this tends to minimize gate fees and often reduces congestion, which in turn helps the airline stay on schedule. Other ways Southwest managed to keep their prices low include the decision not to offer in-flight meals, um, they don't have any seat assignments, they don't have a first-class cabin or amenities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So but this freedom campaign really helped entrench Southwest as the low-cost market leader. This campaign focused on how their low fares often uh, offered millions of Americans the freedom to fly, and this includes many who would otherwise never be able to afford a, a plane ticket. You may remember the ads. They were always very focused on humor and always ended with the ding, which was, you know, followed by that recognizable tagline, you are now free to move about the country. And, you know, and that, of course, mimics the pilot's announcement that the seatbelt sign had been turned off. This was a very powerful campaign that really, really entrenched the company as that low-cost carrier. Uh, I think, too, it's very interesting. If, if a company is going to pursue a low-cost brand strategy, then they have to be the low-cost producer, or otherwise you get into trouble very quickly. But Southwest, through all of the things that you uh, outlined, was and remains the low cost producer within the category so they can safely pursue a low cost strategy. Right. Looking at MasterCard, uh, we find a campaign that has continued to engage consumers for more than two decades now. And that's really because it tapped into a universal human truth that emotional experiences matter more than things. Master, MasterCard in, in this campaign set out to connect people to priceless possibilities. So this shift of focus from the tangible to the experiences that money can't buy was really a bold move for the category but it was done so consistently and so authentically by creating these stories around consumer passions such as sports or music or travel. Um, and people related to these stories, so the campaign really managed to connect with them. Each execution was, was really successful in engaging consumers because they were eagerly awaiting to see what that priceless moment would be. And they always knew it would offer a very emotionally satisfying payoff. And uh, I've read uh, recently, uh, Christy, that MasterCard is eliminating the word MasterCard as a part of its logo. So it's just going to use its logo on the assumption that that's going to communicate the MasterCard like the Venn, brand identity. Venn diagram there. For the and um, I would venture that this might be a 
tiny, tiny mistake. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> uh, Dawn is a brand of laundry detergent that uh, has done a fantastic job with a cause or purpose marketing. Now, cause and purpose marketing for most brands, and I know it's the fashion trend right now, and every brand is supposed to have some uh, purpose, uh, you know, and have some cause that they're supporting. But in most cases, cause and purpose marketing is a vast waste of a brand's money and a waste of their advertising. But Dawn uh, is, is the exception. They have used a cause or purpose to reinforce uh, their brand identity and their brand message. And Dawn's underlying strategy is to be the best detergent to remove oil and grease. And so if Dawn could remove oil and grease from wildlife and bird feathers, it, you know, it, and it's safe enough to use for that purpose, but strong enough to get the grease and the oil off of the wild animals, you know, it must be safe enough for your hands and strong enough to clean grease off of your pots and pans and dishes. So this is a, a great campaign and a great strategy, uh, and, it, and it shows how to use cause or purpose marketing in, in, a, in a very effective way. Most brands don't have a, a natural linkage the way Dawn has created here, and that's why the purpose marketing just doesn't work very well in most cases. So we've just offered some examples of what we consider to be strong or maybe not so strong uh, brand strategies or executions of brand strategies. But how do you go about creating a solid brand strategy for your brand? <clears throat> well, the process begins with knowing where a brand currently exists. And this is in terms of its position in the marketplace, in terms of its image, its messages and communications, all compared to the competition. So it's important to know what a brand is saying but it's even more important to understand what it is that the target audience is hearing and what they're believing. This is all part of understanding the brand's starting point. The second part of developing a brand strategy is about defining the vision or the future of the brand. So where does the brand want to go? What does the brand want to be in terms of positioning, imagery, messaging, etc.? As we've illustrated our, in our examples, um, you know, brand strategies can be relatively simple, but execution is just as important as the underlying strategy. And in fact, sometimes execution can be a catalyst of transfer transformation. So back to the starting point, uh, Christy, uh, generally it's really helpful to review, review all existing research if, if it's available. It'd be everything from brand tracking or product testing, uh, any qualitative research that's been done where the brand might be directly or indirectly discussed. Uh, so there's no point in reinventing the wheel. So review existing custom research that a client might have to learn as much about the brand as it exists today as possible. Sometimes there's good secondary or syndicated research data that can be bought at relatively reasonable rates, and that might be another component in trying to understand where the brand is. And then I think it's really important to have at the very beginning of trying to develop a new brand strategy to have in-depth discussions, kickoff meetings with key stakeholders. And so understanding where the brand is in their minds, where they think it is, what they think the starting point is, and what they envision as the end point. Where do they want to take the brand? 
So this, this vision for the brand or where the management wants to take it is a really important factor in how you go about developing the new brand strategy. You know, another part of this starting point to consider as you develop the brand strategy is who is your target audience? Um, you know, the ultimate consumer is an obvious answer to that question, but there are many other potential target audiences you may want to consider, and many of them might not be so obvious. So, for instance, what is the balance between your customers and prospects? <clears throat> what, what would the brand strategy look like for that? Should the brand strategy influence the trade or channels of distribution? And what about purchasing department or other gatekeepers? And then a big one, um, you know, think about the brand's employees. So, you know, if you take McDonald's, which has thousands upon thousands of employees, um, those employees are an important part of that target audience that should be considered. A brand strategy could really impact employee pride or employee morale in the company. And in some instances, a brand strategy might be intended to positively shape the perceptions of Wall Street or, or government, governmental regulators. But really, the bottom line is that we just must think carefully and deeply about exactly who this brand strategy needs to influence. And qualitative research... Uh is generally the next step in the process. And I can't overstate how important good qualitative research is to beginning this process of creating new brand strategy. And the, the, the old fashioned in-person depth interview is still the gold standard and our preferred and recommended method to study brands. And we want to look at all dimensions of brand awareness and brand knowledge and brand imagery and the symbolism tied to the brand. And not only for our brand, but we want to know that for competitive brands as well. And one of the reasons we so much favor the depth interview technique is that it permits, it, it allows us enough time that we can look at multiple brands and we can bring in projective techniques to tease out dimensions of brand imagery that people might not be fully conscious of and might not be able to articulate in a direct questioning mode. But we can get at some of these underlying factors and dimensions with projective techniques. If you know, sometimes the qualitative research is so good, so powerful, so revealing that we're ready to sit down and start writing strategy concepts. But sometimes it only generates good starting points, gives us a, a context, a framework within to generate more ideas. And this is where we would bring in ideation. And of course, you want to focus that ideation or use people from your core target audiences. And one of the keys to making ideation highly effective is to use individuals who are more creative than other people. And this seems like a really simple idea, and it is, and it's extremely powerful. We can test people for creativity. And we can do ideation sessions online. Uh, and, we, and if we do it online, typically we'll, it'll take place over a period of several days. And if we do it in person, it would be an all-day workshop with eight to ten highly creative individuals. But whether we do it online over several days or in person for a whole day, each session, each ideation session, will typically generate approximately 500 unique ideas or idea fragments. And if we do two or three sessions, uh, two or three workshops, ideation workshops, 
then we may generate up to as many as a thousand or fifteen hundred unique ideas. And all of these ideas become the 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 core matter from which we mine strategy concepts. So we're not gonna, you know, consumers or creative individuals are not gonna magically come up with a brand strategy. But all of the ideas they generate help stimulate our thinking so that we can put a team of people together to go in and mine all of those ideation outputs for the, the nuggets that we can build brand strategies around. And this, this whole process of ideation process typically will produce up to 25 or so unique strategy concepts that are very close to being ready to test. So now that we've kind of gone through this qualitative and the ideation processes, the next step is to review all of the, the best strategy concepts with the client to you know, trim the fat, if you will, or kind of winnow down the number of concepts that we really want to pursue. <clears throat> so as a part of this phase, we would work to eliminate the concepts that for some reason or another just aren't technically or economically feasible. We would also seek to eliminate positionings and messages that may too closely resemble what the competition is doing. And we'd want to find ways to strengthen these strategy concepts. <clears throat> now, after this client review, um, you know, if, if budget allows, we would always recommend a, you know, a quick qualitative review um, of these remaining strategy concepts. So we're talking about maybe 15 to 20 IDIs. And the purpose is really just to fine tune these concepts. Um, before we we go into final testing. So once we get to final strategy concepts and ready to test, partly what we do, I mean, depends on how many concepts we have. So if, if we end up with 20 concepts, then the first stage would be some type of screening where the goal would be to reduce the number of concepts down to four or five of the strongest strategy concepts. But for these four or five finalists in stage two, we would recommend monadic testing. So we would build these strategy concepts, and by monadic testing, I mean that each concept would be tested by an independent but matched sample of people who constitute the target audience for this, this brand. So if we were testing five strategy concepts and we were gonna have 300 target audience consumers in the sample, we do 300 for concept A, 300 for concept B, 300 for concept C, and so on. And one final idea here, it's really important as we look at the kinds of questions we ask and how we value, how we weigh those, those uh, the answers to those questions, is that we want to look at the results in terms of volumetric potential. You know, we don't care who likes a strategy the best. That's not what we're trying to measure. We're trying to measure which strategy is going to drive sales volume upward? That's what I mean by volumetric potential. So brand strategy is obviously crucial to the long-term success of a brand. And the role of execution is so important that we always recommend very rigorous testing of the advertising campaigns that are intended to execute this strategy. So advertising testing helps determine if the core strategy is one, if it's correctly executed. Um, 
Two, is it understood by the target consumers? Are we getting through the message that we intend to? And three, is this strong enough to generate or increase sales? So as we've seen from some of the examples presented today, creative execution can really transform and amplify a core brand strategy. And advertising testing increases everyone's confidence that a winning strategy, along with a winning execution, will really move that needle. And this is often necessary, as many of you know, to justify adequate financial resources to put behind the campaign and support for the long term. And Christy, one of the really important things about advertising testing is that, you know, if we think of advertising as kind of the long range artillery of, of marketing. So if you know for sure that your advertising is on strategy, that it's really going to work, then you can go to the bank and borrow the money you need to invest in your advertising at a sufficient level and over a long period of time to really move a brand upward. So brand tracking is typically once, uh, once you're to a winning campaign with great advertising and you're, everything is on strategy and synced up, a next best practice is brand tracking. And sometimes you can combine brand tracking with advertising tracking, but generally they're separated because the, the ad tracking Typically, you're doing that either continuously or you're doing it relatively frequently, like maybe every three months or every two months. But brand, brand image and brand awareness metrics tend to change relatively slowly. So generally, you know, two waves of, of interviews a year or once a year even is enough to, uh, to monitor uh, brand metrics. And so again, we're tracking awareness uh, and we're tracking brand knowledge and we're trying to measure all of the imagery attached to the brand. And not only our brand, we want to include the primary competitive brands as well. As well. And the tracking, you know, once a, once a strategy and a campaign is deployed, all kinds of things begin to happen. You know, competitors begin to react. The market begins to change. So this tracking allows us to make sure that our strategy is working and that it's on track. And if we need to tweak it a little bit or if something is, is running off the rails, we can learn about it through our brand tracking. So as an add-on to the brand tracking that Jerry just talked about, brand equity modeling can also serve to strengthen the brand tracking. Um, and, you know, brand equity modeling is essentially quantifying and measuring a brand's equity over time. And we do this by capturing measures for brand awareness, for the depth of brand knowledge, and for the strength of the brand's imagery and associations. And then we weave all of this together to, to build a model um, you know, that provides a comprehensive measure of the brand's equity. Now, it's important to note that the brand equity model for a consumer packaged good may look very different than the brand equity model for a technology brand or perhaps a clothing retailer. Um, and that's because each of the components of the brand equity model must be customized to fit within the brand's category and in, you know, into the overall strategy of the brand. It needs to account for where the brand currently exists and where it's, where it's trying to go. So the growth of this brand equity measure um, becomes the ultimate factor or determinant of the brand strategy's success over time of course, in combination with um, actual sales data. You know, and different clients <clears throat> and different brands may be using advertising in, in a different way. 
So the model, that's another reason we may need to customize the model. So there's, you just can't use a cookie cutter approach here. And that's a really good point, Christy. So strategy, once, once you get to a, a brand strategy and a successful execution of the strategy, that should become the, the axis, the organizing principle for the brand and everything connected to the brand and all touch points, including everything from product quality to how the way the packaging looks to service levels and support and channels of distribution, all of the components that make up the brand and the customers or the consumers experience of the brand must all fit together and reinforce each other and reinforce the overall strategy. And the power of brand strategy is quite remarkable because if a brand is on the right <clears throat> strategy, it tends to make all elements of the marketing mix work better. And the right brand strategy means over time that a brand can command higher prices, higher margins, can better withstand economic distress and economic slowdowns, it can also be a shield against negative publicity. And, and the right strategy enhances the investment returns on, on all marketing expenditures. And in a way, you can think of, of a brand as a, as a constant in a world of change and confusion and, and chaos. The brand can be relatively constant and be a social, you know, be a source of security to consumers. That concludes our overview of brand strategy. We did not talk about brand architecture and some of the finer points of brand strategy, since this was intended to be a high-level overview of brand strategy. Uh, so we will attempt to answer questions that have come in, and thank you for sending in uh, questions. Christy, I know you've got the list of questions there. Yeah, so um, one question that's come in is, why do you recommend monadic testing for final strategy concepts? I know you had talked about that's what we recommend and each person seeing kind of a different concept, one concept and a different one. Uh, do you the, want to talk about? The, the reason we recommend monadic testing is that, um, so we're using independent samples. So there's no interaction between the strategy concepts if we test them monadically. Um, there's no contamination among the concepts or between the concepts if we're testing monadically. So it's a, it's a pure, cleaner, uh, more perfect way to measure reactions to a particular strategy and to understand the subtleties and the reasons why that strategy is working or not working without contamination from other concepts or other strategies. Um, so another question, which I'll try to field this one and then probably turn it over to Jerry to either build on my point or perhaps disagree with me, but um, <laughs> Uh, the next question is: What types of research are most is what? Oh, sorry. What type of research is most valuable in developing brand strategy? So I know we've covered a, a number of research methodology research methodologies that all kind of play into this process. Um, in terms of what's probably most valuable, um, I would. I would have to argue there's really no substitute for rich qualitative research in this development of brand strategy. Um, I, you know, I think it's the most effective to explore the brand, explore the messaging, you know, both broadly and deeply. Um, and, you know, it tells you not only what is resonating with consumers, but it really answers the why and the how, which is you don't get that in quantitative research. So, you know, it, it 
understanding the whys and hows, how something might be able to be tweaked to improve the communication or or the message is is really crucial. Um, I just think that no matter where you are in the process or whether you have a, a newer brand or a more established brand, um, qualitative research is you know really going to provide that the most powerful nuanced insight to, to best guide that strategy development. And I think um, that's absolutely true and, and I totally agree with with everything you've said. Uh, I would add that using qualitative as the launching pad and then including ideation, that combination is very powerful also. And I remember uh, once um, uh, observing an ideation session. It was primarily women. They were talking about lotions, and this was research that we did our, on our own, that so we own the data. But these women, uh, you know, after hours and hours of talking about lotions, began to talk about the smell of grass. And when they were children and playing in the grass and rolling in the grass in spring and summer, and, and how what a, what a wonderful fragrance that was, and how invigorating it was, and all the memories and emotions it brought back. And, you know, and we all sat and looked at each other in stunned <laughs> silence because that, that had never occurred to any of us that, that you know, that grass might represent a, a whole new source of, of fragrances nostalgia. and imagery yes. and nostalgia to link to, to brands. So the ideation itself can be very, very powerful, especially mm -hmm. when you're using creative individuals to, you know. And one of the things you will notice in ideation sessions is that, you know, the, the moderators work really hard to get all of the, the barriers to creativity down. You know, and we don't realize how structured and how rigid and how limited we are in, in the way we interact with people daily. And one of the things that shocks most people in these ideation sessions is after two or three hours, the, the guard begins to come down and you start seeing all this sexual suggestion and interplay among the participants, which shocked me the first time I ever saw it. But that's, a, that's an indication of these barriers being lowered, these social barriers and these social taboos going away and people getting into the most creative state of mind. All right. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Um, but thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. If we did not get to your question, um, just be uh, assured that we will follow up with you directly and make sure that we get an answer to you. So thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Jerry and Christy, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's Insider Series webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to email Jerry or Christy. We have not yet scheduled our next Insider Series webinar. In the meantime, please feel free to register for our next e for our email newsletter, to read about our blogs, view our educational videos, and keep to up to date on our next webinar. Thank you again for attending and have a wonderful rest of the day.